I'm Steve Clemens, and I have a question. With the election behind us, will the Republican Party dump Trump? Let's get to the bottom line. Even though he was voted out of the White House, most agree that Donald Trump and Trumpism are not going away. The vote was close, the Senate is still Republican controlled, and Republican members of Congress defeated Democrats all over the country. So even though he lost the election, Trump is still the major force driving his base and his party. What does that mean for the future of Republicans over the next few years? What lessons is the party learning from this election? And how will they deal with the incoming Democratic administration led by Joe Biden and Kamala Harris? Joining me is former Senator Chuck Hagel, who has served as defense secretary in the Obama administration. He was a conservative senator from Nebraska and a lifelong Republican, well known as one of America's lead bipartisan voices. Secretary Eagle, thank you so much for joining us today. You're part of a group called the National Council on Election Integrity. We've just had this major election. More Americans voted in this election than have voted in a century in this country. They're back, they're back at it. A lot of people are saying that election is not over. You are a Republican, but one who does not support Donald Trump. What do we need to achieve at this point to get a sound, secure, trustable election result that more Americans will believe in than are than are um, on the case now. Well, th Steve, thanks for having me on. Uh, I've always believed the essence of democracy is the trust and confidence in our free, fair, secure elections. And if most Americans uh, feel that this past election was fair and was secure and was honest, then um, that's a big thing, that's a big deal, because that's where you start. If the citizenry of this country don't believe that the elections were fair, or if they were stolen, or if they were fraudulent, they're not gonna believe anything. They're not gonna believe in their leaders, they're not gonna believe in what their leaders say. So I, I think, uh, to a great extent, we've accomplished a good deal of that. I, I know there are lawsuits, there'll be more. I know there are recounts, but we've always had recounts, it's in the law. You, you can have recounts, uh, but I, I think what we've got to do is try to find ways, and leaders have this responsibility, to uh, reinsert, readjust America's confidence in its institutions again. You do that not by saying it or talking about it, but by showing that they can trust their institutions of governance. And by the way, not just governance, the media, uh, all institutions, higher education, religion, uh, journalism, uh, the law, Congress, politics. And no, it's not a perfect picture, but I think that's where you start. And I think uh, if Joe Biden can accomplish that and in the first few years of uh, his administration, he will have brought this country back a long way. And that's, that's what we have to do. We've got to trust the system. Then, then we can have our debates, then we can have our differences, then we can fight it out. But, but that trust and confidence is the number one baseline for a democracy. Secretary Hagel, what failed? I, I remember covering you in the United States Senate and you didn't always like my coverage. Sometimes, you know, you would duck me, but I would, I would, I would you know, ask you in the sense that you were unpredictable to me on occasion. You were not a predictable vote in one column, particularly in foreign policy uh, issues. And I'm just wondering, one, are you bothered by how predictable votes have become? Votes on the Supreme Court, votes in the United States Senate. And I'm just wondering where the thinking and introspection is. You know, and I, and I think secondly, what happened to that kind of Republican? Why have you failed and your colleagues failed to keep the Republican Party a thoughtful party? Well, uh, obviously, I can't speak for my former colleagues or anybody in office now. But uh, for me, Steve, to answer your question, um, I always had a North Star. It didn't mean I was always right or I had the right answer, but I had a North Star. I, I knew why I was there. Uh, and I used to say, and you've heard me say it, and I said it on the floor of the Senate on speeches when uh, I was being... <laughs> Uh, I, I was being ridiculed by some of my Republican colleagues as a rhino, Republican in name only, and I was, uh, I was disloyal to the Republican Party. 
uh, I used to say we take an oath of office to the Constitution. We don't take an oath of office to a political party or a president or anybody else. It's the Constitution. And as long as you have that privilege of serving this country in some capacity in elective office, your focus, your North Star should be what you think is the right thing to do for your country, obviously who you represent, your state, uh, but for your country. And I never got confused about that. Again, didn't mean I was any better than anybody else or I was right all the time. Uh, but I think we've lost some of that. And um, I think we've lost it over the years. I don't think it was just President Trump. I think he put a fine point on it the last four years. But, but this idea of you've got to be all Republican or all Democrat and support everything the Democrat says or the Republicans say, or you're not a good party member is nonsense. We've never been that way. There's no corner on the market on good ideas or honesty or the right thing by one party and the other party is excluded. So um, that's a democracy. That's the way democracies work. You come together, you listen to each other, you respect each other, you, you debate out your differences, you settle them, you compromise, and you move, you move the country ahead for the good of the country. You're well known as a foreign policy realist. And for those uh, who want a quick dose of what realism means, it means you see the world as it is, not the world you'd like it to be. You know, as you see other foreign leaders looking at our leadership right now, both in Donald Trump and this change to Joe Biden uh, in the White House, from a realist perspective, what are they seeing? Do they see the United States as a pushover? Uh, do they see the United States as in strategic contraction and not going to matter as much? I'm interested in uh, this is your world. How, how do you think they see us? Well, I think the last four years, and I've talked to many, many ambassadors, foreign ministers, defense ministers, prime ministers. Uh, and so this is not just my opinion. This is in talking with a lot of people. Um, I think they, they, see us, they see us in a way that, that's confusing to them. Um, certainly since World War II, uh, this country has engaged the world. We've engaged other countries. We led in building a, a new world order after World War II, the liberal trade order that, uh, that built institutions of common interest. United Nations, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, World Bank, IMF, Collective Security, NATO, so, so on and so on. And so they've been confused as to who we really are the last four years because we've pushed back. We've not engaged. Uh, we've essentially tariffed and sanctioned our own allies. We've questioned their friendship. Uh, we have a president who said, I'm not sure we need NATO. They, they have uh, lived off of us. We've supported the world. We're not going to do that anymore. That's confused our allies. That's confused the world. And I think in Biden, they see a whole different approach because, first of all, they know Biden. Uh, Biden was in the Senate 36 years, Foreign Relations Committee 36 years, eight years as vice president. There's hardly a, a leader in the world today he does not have a personal relationship with. They know him. They trust him. Don't always agree with him. But the coin of the realm in any business, but especially in foreign policy and politics, is trust. Do you trust that person's word? You may disagree with them, but do you trust them? I think they trust Joe Biden. They know that Joe Biden is an engagement uh, a person who, as president, will engage us again, will bring America back. I think we've kind of found ourselves the last four years on an island. Um, I think we've isolated ourselves. And uh, when America is isolated, when America is off balance, the world becomes more dangerous. I mean, not that every problem in the world is our fault or we need to deal with, not at all. But we, we are the one, and I know this is a trite expression started by President Reagan, but we are truly the one beacon in the world. There, there's no other country like ours. As many mistakes as we make and we're imperfect and do dumb things sometimes, but the world, world trusts that. And when that's gone, there's no other beacon. And people get lost, get confused, and bad things happen. When you were Secretary of Defense, and, and again, you know, just reporting on you at that time, there wasn't always a consensus in the Obama administration about how to deal with 
a, a problematic country like Syria or what to do in response uh, to Russia or you know China's growing influence in the South China Sea uh, and globally. And so I'm wondering what you think is going to be the case around Joe Biden when he comes in, because there's a wing of foreign policy, you know, and a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters who, who in their own views, sound pretty similar to Donald Trump, that they don't see that global engagement pays off. Is, is Joe Biden going to be caught in a vice between these same uh, kinds of groups that often created some confusion in President Obama's foreign policy? Well, uh, I don't know about caught in the vice, Steve, but th there are differences, uh, as you know, and you noted. Uh, in the Democratic Party, there are differences in the Republican Party on, on foreign policy. Uh, Joe Biden is going to have to navigate this very carefully. But I think based on his experience, based on people who know him, uh, both international leaders, both leaders here in this country and in, in his own party, uh, they know who he is. They know what he represents. They know his history. And I think as long as he deals with everybody directly and honestly, he listens to everybody, listens to Bernie Sanders, listens to, to everybody, then, then he's president. He's got to decide. He has to make the decisions. He's going to have to do what he thinks is the right thing for this country. And I know, I know, uh, he'll do that. It's it's not always uh, it's not always easy. The world is is different uh, certainly than it was 12 years ago when uh, Joe and Barack Obama became the president and vice president. Uh, some problems are still the same, and uh, and they're worse. I think that the Middle East is in more chaos. Uh, other parts of the world a little better, maybe North Korea. Uh, China has risen uh, over the last 12 years. So it's going to take, I think, a, a new evaluation, a new review. I think you'll see in Biden uh, an effort to review our our security interests in the world, review our policies in the world. I think that's probably underway now. Uh, he'll bring in experienced people. He'll, he'll bring in the best people. Uh, he will field a team of uh, people who the world can trust, the, the United States can trust, uh, and that will be his his foreign policy, but it'll be based on what certainly is good for the United States and good for the world. They're, those are not mutually exclusive. Matter of fact, all those institutions that we built, le led in building after World War II, uh, were uh, mutual consensus institutions. Uh, mutual interests, common interest institutions. If, if the world was more peaceful, that was good news for everybody, for mm. trade, education, exchange programs, more freedom, uh, more opportunities, more hope. So this is not a one-way street. And I think President Trump somehow has, has gotten confused over the years about what, what foreign policy is and engagement. It's not a one-way street. It, 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 it's, it's a two-way street. It's, we can all as global citizens, as all part of a global community, benefit uh, from a steady, prosperous, peaceful world. And I think that that'll be Joe Biden's approach. You know, one of your other uh, close friends um, has was Jim Mattis, you know, who was secretary of defense, yeah. you know, a successor in your job, of course. Um, and so, you know, his thoughts and views well, and he's put them out there. But another person that just got uh, uh, terminated in that position is Mark Esper. He was fired by tweet. Secretary of Defense, you know, really remarkable moment. Um, and Secretary Esper, you know, went out and said, uh, if Donald Trump gets a yes man in that position, you know, God help all of us. What do you think our DEF CON level should be regarding concern over what Mark Esper shared? Well, um, first, I have uh, great confidence in uh, our national security enterprise, our institutions, uh, and, our, and our leaders, our uniform military leaders, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs all the way down to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, all our leaders. Uh, they will follow the law. Uh, they will protect the Constitution, regardless who se the Secretary of Defense is, regardless who the President is. Uh, and uh, they are schooled in, in uh, how to do that, and if they uh, object to an order, what's the process? So 
uh, I'm not too concerned about uh, any of that. Uh, I think uh, Esper's comments are comments that should be taken seriously. And um, matter of fact, Mark Esper worked for me uh, in the Senate. Uh, but I think any Secretary of Defense would would uh, probably approach it the same way Esper did in, in what, he's, what he said yesterday in those, in those remarks. But I have confidence in our system, our people, the enterprise that uh, uh, we'll be okay regardless of who the president is. It might be messy. It could be messy. It could result in a constitutional crisis. But uh, our military leaders are not going to let anything happen to this country. You know, one of the other things that occurs to me, because Saib Erekat, whom you knew well, has just died from COVID. Yeah. Um, and so it puts, at least for a moment, a uh, 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 you know, a spotlight back on the fact that nothing has been achieved in terms of the Palestinian statehood issue or, you know, autonomy issue in quite a long time. Do you think that issue is one that can just be ignored forever, brushed under the rug? Uh, or do you think fundamentally for stability in the region in the Middle East that the Palestine-Israel problems got to be solved in a way that we're not, you know, attending to right now? Well, I think we are going to have to pay attention to it. And, um, Obviously, the last four years, uh, uh, we did everything to essentially just shove it out of the way and make it more difficult and more complicated. Uh, but it, but it's going to have to be dealt with. And uh, if you just look at the Middle East today, I think the Middle East today is more volatile, more explosive, uh, more out of balance uh, than we we've seen probably since the. the the 1973 uh, Yom Kippur War. Uh, and um, that's dangerous because you look at the, the essentially non-functioning governments in the Middle East, Syria, uh, Libya, Yemen, Iraq still got uh, deep uh, problems. Uh, Lebanon essentially has no government. Uh, that's not going to get better. That's not going to get better. And I don't lay it all at the at the feet of the Palestinian-Israeli issue, but it, but that is part of the, of the larger framework of issues. And I think Biden has always been a leader in this area, and he's always been smart about it. And he's tough. And I I would suspect uh, he's going to probably uh, address uh, this uh, in his uh, first four years. Now, it's I know every president sees it as a no-win situation. Why would I want to get involved in it? Why would I want to do this? Why would I want to go there? But I don't think that, that you can walk away from it. The United States has to take some responsibility in helping facilitate an agreement there. And uh, my guess is that Biden uh, w will do that. I think the priorities in his strategic uh, thinking and his foreign policy as it develops uh, is, isn't going to necessarily put the Palestinian issue at the top. Uh, but but I think it's going to be uh, on the agenda. Right. Well, presuming President Trump does finally leave the White House, uh, uh, reluctant as he may be, do you think that your friends in the Republican Party establishment are going to have an opportunity to do an autopsy of the party? Or do you think the party, where it is, the base, is firmly going to carry on with this Trumpist track? I, are, are there is there a chance for folks like you and your ilk to come back and play a role in rebuilding and resuscitating uh, the Republican Party? Well, I know this is difficult uh, for the uh, Trump supporters. I mean, after all, uh, he, Mr. Trump, received uh, over 71 million voters support. Uh, so I know it's tough to lose. And uh, these these people strongly supported him. So right now it's still inflammatory, still charges of fraud and all, all the rest that we see every day playing out in lawsuits. Uh, that will that will ease. That will stabilize once we get certification uh, of a new president and the confirmation of that uh, when the electors meet. I think December fourteenth and. Then, then we can move on. But, but to your point, uh, I think the Republican Party is going to have to take a look at itself. Uh, uh, what happened here, especially you've got the Republicans actually picking up 
seats in the House. Um, it appears they've got a good shot at continuing to control the Senate, depending on the mm. two Georgia Senate seats. But yet, they lost an incumbent president uh, by over four million votes. So what happened? I mean, we're on the wrong track. There's another factor here that the Republicans have got to look at, and that's demography. Uh, look at Texas. Look what happened in Georgia, uh, Arizona, Nevada. Um, those demographic shifts are not in favor of Republicans. They're moving toward the Democrats. And I remember uh, when uh, I was the lead sponsor of President w, George W. Bush's immigration reform bill in the Senate. And in fact, I took President Bush out to Omaha and we kicked off mm -hmm. his immigration reform uh, initiative in South Omaha. And I remember, in, I think it was 2004, in our Tuesday Republican caucus luncheon, there was a big debate about it. And of course, there was a big debate all the time about it. Uh, I remember Kay Bailey Hutchison, Senator Kay Bailey yeah. Hutchison from Texas, Gallup, and she said, if the Republican Party does not get right on immigration reform, we will be a minority party in Texas in the not too distant future. Well, hmm. Her words right. rang true. Her words rang true. So the Republican Party's got some real soul searching to do. Uh, and I, th I think they'll, they'll have to go through that. Uh, I hope they'll, they'll go through that. I hope they right. will, they'll bring in some uh, other voices uh, to, take, to take a look. But that's the only right. way you can understand what went wrong and what you have to do to get right and what's, where, where's the future going. Right. Final question. Secretary Hagel, I know that you have probably already written a letter uh, to President-elect Biden. I know that President-elect Biden will, uh, if he hasn't already, reach out to you by phone and talk to you. I just, I just know that to be true. What is the top piece of advice you would offer a president like Joe Biden coming into this role at this time in history? What's the most important thing? What's the North Star he has to have? Well, um I would, I would start with the North Star, which in all my time around Joe Biden, and I've known him and worked with him in different capacities for over 25 years, I've been all over the world with him, been in situations with leaders with him. Uh, he's, always, uh, he's always stayed true to his North Star. That, that's where I, I would start. The other advice I would give him is, uh, and he knows this too, but we all uh, need to be reminded sometimes of things. <clears throat> Listen, uh, be inclusive, and and, and reach out. Uh, I, I think those are very important qualities in a president. And he's already said it. I intend to be a president for all of America, Republicans, Democrats, and I believe he will do that. And he needs to stay uh, true to that. And the humanity that Joe Biden represents the, the dignity, the decency, uh, don't, uh, don't ever allow that to go away. You are anchored by that decency and that dignity. And we need a new and, and clear infusion of dignity and decency in the White House. And I think that may, may be his biggest challenge and the, and, and the biggest accomplishment that he can make in four years. And if he can do that, he will have gone a long way in putting this country back on track and having confidence in each other and in our institutions. Because a country cannot survive if, if we lose confidence in our institutions, the very governing institutions in our society that hold us together. If, if that isn't there, we're doomed. And if he can do that, then I think along with other things that he'll do, he'll have had a very, very productive and successful four years. And that'd be my advice. Well, Secretary Chuck Hagel, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing these thoughts. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. So what is the bottom line? The genius of Donald Trump was to mock elites, turn his back on the rest of the world, shout about how he was fighting for the hardworking men and women of America, and pander to the fears of the white majority as U.S. demographics keep shifting. This makes for a formula that almost won this election. And there's nothing to indicate now that Republicans are suddenly going to dump Trump. In fact, the opposite seems true, as many senators and House members are trying to prove their loyalty to him out there by supporting the possibility that fraud gave the win to Joe Biden and stole it from Trump.
Even a president, Joe Biden, will have to make compromises with Trumpism as part of his daily diet when he moves to the White House next January. And that's the bottom line.